Hello, my dark darlings. I'm Markia, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. To our veteran listeners and those just voyaging into the dark with us for the first time, welcome. If you are enjoying these episodes, do me a favor. Rate and review this episode. It really helps us keep bringing more stories to you each and every week. So, stories. We often believe the stories we are told because they comfort us. These stories can explain the mysterious, the inconceivable, even deadly disappearances. But sometimes stories are used deceptively to hide and obscure the truth, to avoid horrible realities that are staring at us right in the face. First, art so breathtaking it kills, followed by a scorned widow turns deadly, then a hidden book filled with terrifying secrets. Finally, in our featured story, don't be fooled by sonorous beauties. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week, and of those, the scariest ones make it into our podcast, along with the story that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com snarled. If you have a tale you're dying to share, send me an email at somethingscary@snarled.com. If you'd like to support Something Scary, then consider joining our Patreon. As a patron, not only can you help the show and see ad-free episodes, you can also be a part of the horror and hear your name featured in one of our podcasts or weekly video stories. Visit patreon.com slash snarled. So, want to hear something scary? Deadly disappearances. Curiosity is a powerful emotion. It can compel us, encourage us, inspire us to do great things. But curiosity has its drawbacks and can lead us into situations we are wholly unprepared for. Like in this story, inspired by Molly. Three best friends, Jamila, Ronit, and Nina, were excited to start sixth grade. It was the year their class took an overnight field trip. Everyone would visit the historical Appleton, a small town with a special, some say, haunted past. When the day came, they giddily boarded the school bus. On the bus ride, they began teasing each other over who would be the one to ask to sleep with the lights on. When they arrived, the first stop was to drop their bags off at the Manor des Amis. The Manor des Amis was once the home of a prominent businessman, but had been converted into an inn. It was grand and eerie, but not without its charm. As they brought their luggage to their rooms, Ronit stopped in front of a large painting, dominating the foyer. It took up nearly the whole wall and depicted a somber-looking young woman. As Ronit stared, she didn't notice the kindly old innkeeper approach her. The old woman startled Ronit as she explained that the painting was of the mansion owner's daughter, Beatrice Glover. Mr. Glover loved Beatrice more than anyone or anything in the whole world. But one day, Beatrice wandered off into the nearby woods and mysteriously disappeared. She was never heard from again. In his despair, Mr. Glover commissioned the portrait of his missing daughter. He spent the rest of his sad life glued to that painting, hoping in vain that she would return. Rumor has it, Beatrice's ghost still haunts those woods. After a day of sightseeing, the class returned to the inn for a good night's sleep. Sharing a room, Ronit told Nina and Jamila about the portrait and Beatrice and the supposedly haunted woods. Jamila was eager to sneak out and test this tale. Nina was hesitant. Ronit was unsure. Jamila pleaded, they hadn't seen anything scary or weird their whole time there. This was their last chance. Unless, Jamila said, you're too scared for a real adventure. Ronit never shied away from a dare. She agreed to sneak out and venture into the woods. Nina, under the pressure of the other two, relented. She grabbed a flashlight and followed the other two out. 
the three friends quietly tiptoed to the lobby, the ancient floor still managing to creak under their feet. They passed by the painting, which again captured Ronit's attention. She paused, certain that Beatrice had been looking in the other direction. Jamila was about to reach for the door to leave when suddenly they heard a voice. A woman's soft, plaintive plea for help. The three turned to listen. It was coming from behind a door near the check-in station. They opened the door, which led to a basement. Again, they heard a woman's quiet cry. They cautiously proceeded down. The cellar was small, with a strong stench of rot, yet it was totally empty. There was no one there. Jamila said they must have been hearing things. Nina scanned the room with her flashlight when she saw it. Chains and shackles attached to the walls. They went closer to inspect. On the walls were dried blood and markings that looked like scratches. The door behind them slammed shut. Startled, they turned to the exit, but standing between them and that was... Beatrice. Ronit recognized her immediately. She looked to be around the same age as she was in the painting, but unlike the angelic version of her in the portrait, she had dirty clothes, matted hair, and torn off fingernails. After a chilling pause, Beatrice told them that her father had been keeping her in the cellar for as long as she could remember. Beatrice had never gone into the forest. That was just the story her angry father had made up so he could keep her hidden. A sputtering Jamila told Beatrice that they had to go. Jamila tried to move, but she was frozen. They all were. Beatrice pleaded with them to stay. She was so lonely. The next morning, The teacher couldn't find Jamila, Nina, or Ronit anywhere. Not in their rooms, not outside. The innkeeper told the teacher about the haunted woods and about relaying that tale to the girls. Maybe they had snuck off to investigate? The teacher was relieved to at least have a lead. And as they all filed out of the mansion to search for the missing girls in the surrounding woods, they once again passed the portrait of the enigmatic Beatrice. And while no one seemed to notice it, Beatrice appeared to be smiling. Thank you so much, Molly, for inspiring this haunted portrait tale for us. This haunted inn. Seems like everything's haunted except for the woods outside. How about you, listener? Have you ever seen a painting that was haunting to you? as if those eyes followed you while you looked at it from different sides. If you were on a trip with friends, would you dare to sneak out into the woods? Or would you be the one to stay behind, thinking you're safe within the house, tucked underneath your covers? Giving in to temptation will give you immediate satisfaction, but there's no telling the terrible consequences that will befall you or your loved ones if you impulsively act on all your desires. Like the sailor in this poem, inspired by Elena. In a world often unseen, there stands a billowing willow tree. Under the branches of memories sits a widow longing for the sea. Once a sailor's husband who sang, his sailor was lost when a siren rang. Tricked by the mermaid's seductive song, his impending death wouldn't take long. Unbeknownst to his husband, he slipped. The sea swallowed him into the abyss. He choked on the water that filled his lungs, his ears bleeding as the siren song was sung. Through tears, the widow sang his tune, crying out to the sun and the moon. A heartbroken melody filled the air. All who witnessed it felt his despair. And under the tree, his song had grown. 
into the roots his soul was sown. Much too young to feel such loss, he stood upon the icy rocks. And as he took that final leap to his husband's arms, he dreamed. The water flowed within his roots to his heart long since mute. Praying as he painfully drowned, but there was no peace that was found. He searches through the sea each night in the never-ending heartbroken plight. Yet if you think the story untrue, legend has a challenge for you. Wait until the darkest night. Find a willow tree with the sea in sight. Watch the waves as they crash ashore and listen to how deep they roar. In their screams, you'll hear it near, the very melody the widow held dear. And if courage conquers your fear, sing it back for all to hear. Walk to the waves and sing the widow's song. The siren will sing back and to her, your life will belong. Thank you so much, Alina, for this wonderful nautical poem. Are you afraid of the deep blue sea? There are so many beautiful but unknown creatures that live beneath the surface. How about sirens? Do you believe in them? Do you have any scary encounters that involve the water that you'd like to share? Tell us at somethingscary@snarl.com. I'm using this summer as a big reset for myself with a little me time. I'll be traveling soon, and before that, I've been giving myself fun self-care challenges, like learning new nail art and making homemade facial scrubs. Summertime is great for fun challenges, like listening to our scariest podcasts, then trying to go to sleep, or spending time racking up puzzle levels with your best fiends. Best Fiends is free to download and is a super fun five-star rated match three mobile puzzle game. Right now, it feels like I'm flying through the levels with my best fiends and I'm already on level 299. One of my favorite fiends is Whisper the Wasp. She's cute and lethal. And with my upcoming travel, I won't have to stop playing if I don't have any Wi-Fi or internet for whatever reason. I can still enjoy the thousands of fun puzzles Best Fiends has to offer. Give Best Fiends a go, but be warned, you might not want to stop. Download the five-star rated puzzle game Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Moving into a new home and adjusting to the space is always a challenge. But when your new home is possessed by a demonic spirit, adjusting wouldn't be an option. Like in this story, inspired by Adrian. And thank you to our patron Yasmin, whose name we use in this story. Yasmin was 16 years old when her family moved into a rundown house in the middle of the woods in Alabama. The moment Yasmin's dad pulled their minivan into the new driveway, Yasmin felt a sense of dread. Her friends were three hours away, and she didn't know anyone at her new school. After getting into an argument with her dad about moving to the middle of nowhere, Yasmin stomped out of her house and went to explore the woods. She didn't know where she was going, she just knew that she had to get out of her house. As she walked towards a creek, she noticed an old ratty book laying beside a tree. Yasmin picked it up. The cover was black. Inside, the pages were filled with drawings of what looked to be a mythical beast. Yasmin did not understand what the book was about, and she tossed it aside to continue exploring the woods. Just then, Yasmin noticed a beautiful deer gazing at her. As she slowly moved towards the deer, she could see that the deer had no eyes. Freaked out, Yasmin ran home. She told her parents what she had seen and that she didn't want to live in this house, that the whole place was creepy. Her mom brushed her off and her dad told her to stop overreacting. Upset that both of her parents ignored her feelings, she stormed off to bed. That night, Yasmin was awakened by the sound of footsteps near her bed. Standing in front of her was a young girl 
dressed in a white ruffled dress. She had bloody marks all over her arms and her eyes were gouged out. Just as quickly as the girl appeared, she disappeared. The next morning at school, Yasmin decided to use the library computer to research the address of her new home. There, she discovered a newspaper article dated 1876. The article was about the Ken family. The family was found brutally murdered, including the daughter Mary, who was found dead with her eyes ripped out from the sockets. The murderer was never found. Yasmin printed the newspaper article to show her parents. That evening, Yasmin once again begged her parents to move. She explained that their house was haunted by a murdered girl. Yasmin's dad was fed up with her dramatic stories. Ghosts weren't real, and she had to come to terms with the fact that this was their home now. He continued to tell her that if she kept up this charade, he would start taking away her privileges. After finally falling asleep, Yasmin was abruptly awakened by the spirit of Mary Ken. She grabbed Yasmin's hand and walked her outside to the same area where Yasmin had found that book. As it turned out, Mary had played in the same woods as Yasmin. She had a sister and two loving parents. One day, Mary had also found a book lying near the creek. But instead of tossing it out, she decided to bring it home with her. Later that night, when Mary read a page from the book, her eyes went black. A feeling surged inside of her. She was overcome with the desire to kill. Her mother wasn't home and her father was at work, but her little sister Annie was in the other room. Mary grabbed an ax and chopped her into pieces. When her parents came home, they were horrified to see their murdered daughter. Mary was clearly possessed, but before her parents could prepare to take any action, Mary brutally murdered them both. Just as quickly as the feeling of being possessed had come over her, it suddenly left her body. To Mary's horror, the first thing she saw was the sight of her dead family. Wanting to unsee her horrible deeds, Mary gouged her own eyes out and slit her own throat upon the axe. Unbeknownst to Mary, the book she found in the woods was cursed. Anyone who read from it would be possessed by the devil himself. Panic set in as Yasmin realized she had read from the same book as Mary. But the next morning, as Yasmin slowly opened her eyes, she was relieved to see no Mary in sight. And honestly, had she read the book or did she just kind of flip through it, she thought to herself. Yasmin got out of bed, took a shower, and got herself ready for school. As she walked into the kitchen to greet her parents, she felt her body go numb. Her hand grabbed the closest knife as her eyes went black. Thank you so much, Adrian, for inspiring this tale. Okay, listener, more than likely you've probably moved before. Well, how difficult was it to get used to your new surroundings? Were there any paranormal or super bizarre things that happened to you in your new house or apartment? Anything about the new land that you're a part of that is peculiar and something that you'd like to share. Many take to the seas and yachts for luxury and parties, but not everyone that is lucky enough to afford to set sail returns home safely, particularly those that venture out into the haunted waters of Karoo, South Africa. Valentina spent three years as a personal assistant for tech billionaire Jeff Coyne. Jeff had promised her that after a year, he would promote her. However, Valentina was spending most of her time doing every kind of demeaning errand, never being thanked and getting paid miserably. The only thing Jeff gave her was crippling anxiety and a nauseating feeling whenever he came into the room. 
after a particularly tough week, she was just about to quit when Jeff invited her to join him for the biggest party of the summer on his yacht in Karoo, South Africa. The guest list included Saudi princes and European royalty. Valentina, who hadn't had a vacation in three years, thought this would be a good opportunity to have some fun and then quit afterwards. As the yacht left the dock, Jeff explained to the group why he had chosen to sail to Karoo, South Africa. He said there was a legend surrounding Karoo that had intrigued him for years. It was believed that the mythical mermaids that swam in those waters could bring good fortune to all who fell under their spell. Jeff laughed, saying that the legend was ridiculous, but on the off chance that they actually did exist, he would never fall under their spell because he already could buy everything his heart desired. More importantly, if he saw a mermaid, he would prefer to kill it and mount it on the wall of his yacht. The first evening, Jeff invited everyone on the deck to have some drinks. As the sky grew darker, Jeff pulled out a crate of $3,000 a bottle Dom Perignon champagne. After bragging about how expensive it was, he opened multiple bottles, pouring the champagne all over himself and willing guests, and then chucking half-filled bottles into the ocean. Valentina snorted in disgust at the waste, remembering why she was quitting and fervently wished Jeff and his arrogant friends would all disappear. As the night continued, the wind picked up and the waves grew angry. Suddenly, a hauntingly melodic song emanated throughout the yacht. The group of billionaires made their way towards the deck to look at the ocean. Swimming alongside the yacht, Valentina was astonished to see figures swiftly swimming in a circle formation. Upon closer look, she could see that these were mermaids. But unlike the ones she'd seen depicted in popular media, multicolored tails flashed under the water. They were dark-skinned, with long, kinky, coily black hair and glowing red eyes. As they chanted, their mouths opened, exposing sharp, predatory teeth. These were the mermaids from the legend of Mami Wata, known for carrying expensive baubles stolen from pirate ships that sailed these waters. The Mami Wata were thought to bring good fortune or dire disaster to those that fell under their spell. A chill ran down Valentina's spine as she watched Jeff and all of his friends begin to undress. One by one, they jumped off the yacht into the churning seas. As they went, many mumbled their deepest desires out loud. At last, I will become the richest man on earth, she heard Jeff say. The sonorous tones of the Mamiwata circled the men. Valentina watched in horror as the leader of them all sank her sharp teeth into Jeff's neck. The Mamiwata's fingers then gouged into his eye sockets and using a supernatural strength, cracked his body in half. As his intestines spilled out, she draped them around her neck like fine jewelry. The other Mamiwata had been watching her in anticipation, waiting for her signal to feast on all of the guests. The leader who had consumed Jeff looked at Valentina with a bloody smile and a sparkle in her glowing red eyes. She nodded to the others, giving them permission to feast. Valentina was so horrified. She covered her eyes and ears and cradled herself as the sound of bones breaking and blood-curdling screams of the rich could be heard while they were eaten alive. When Valentina finally opened her eyes, the dark brown-skinned red-eyed Mamiwata was laying in front of her on the yacht, multicolored tail flicking in the air as she stared into her soul. The leader then whispered, Don't you see? Everything your heart desired has come true. Come, be with us, child. Valentina's wish for everyone on that yacht to disappear had come true. As if someone else was controlling her body, Valentina stood up and took the Mami Wata's hand as they both dived into the ocean, never to be seen again.
This week's podcast stories were edited by Markia McCarty, Sarah Lukasiewicz, and Gail Gilman. Narration by Markia McCarty. Audio edited and mixed by Fitz Harris. Additional audio editing by Calvin Lenderman. Art and graphics by Mari Carlson. Produced by Hannah Mullen and Markia McCarty. Music by Sapphire Sandalo and Calvin Lenderman. Executive producer, Gail Gilman. 